Welcome. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Um, this is an annual event for the Tumor Vaccine Group, and wow, has it grown. It started as a way for us to pay back our patients who've enrolled on our clinical trials, and we've had a lot of people enroll over the last decade that we've been running clinical trials. So the Tumor Vaccine Group is composed of multiple, multiple types of scientists. My name is Nora Desis. I'm a physician, a medical oncologist. I'm also a lab bench researcher. And you'll meet tonight a lot of different people in the group, whether they're pharmacologists or toxicologists, nurses, research coordinators, biostatisticians, physicians. It really takes a lot of different people to come together to develop new therapeutics or diagnostic tests that will actually benefit people with cancer. So as a group, um, translational research really focuses on questions. And our questions all surround the immune system. Can we prevent cancer relapse with, let's say, a cancer vaccine? So cancer vaccines are a major scientific program in our group. Can we treat advanced cancer with immunity? People who have overwhelming infections have an immune response to those infections, which eventually over time will make the infections go away. Is there any way we can give a rip-roaring immune response to treat patients who are no longer responding to standard therapies? And that program is all encompassed with an idea of developing T-cell therapy. I'll talk about that. One big question we ask is, if the immune system has a role to play in cancer, and I'll show you some evidence that it does, why, do, why does cancer occur? Why doesn't the immune system completely eradicate cancer? So we have a program really surrounding modulating the tumor microenvironment, really looking at basic questions of why the immune response is not functional and therapeutic ways that we can overcome that to try to make that immune response functional. And finally, can we use immunity to diagnose cancer? If you've ever gotten like a tetanus shot or a hepatitis shot, they always check your immune response and then they say, oh, you're good to go, that shot worked. Um, can we use exposure to cancer and the measurement of that exposure to potentially diagnose people or predict people who've been exposed to cancer? So we have a program in cancer diagnostics. So I'd like to first talk about multi-antigen vaccine development. And antigen is a word that describes proteins or portions of cancer that can stimulate an immune response. And so when I talk about a cancer development program, you can see the number of people who are involved in that development going all the way from people like Dr. Gad, who's working with animals to try to figure out how to develop vaccines, um, Dr. Holt, who's actually making new ways to immunize, all the way to Dr. Salazar, uh, Danelle Wallace, Nicole Bates, who are translating those vaccines directly into clinical practice. So when you think about trying to stimulate an immune response to cancer, the first thing you have to think about is how do you generate tumor immunity? And one of the big things that's happened in the last decade that our group has been in existence is a much better understanding of that pathway. So first you start with the tumor. And um, here we have the tumor. And basically at the top of the, the circle, the tumor has lots of proteins inside it and outside it, attached to it. And many of these proteins cause the tumor to grow. Many proteins that are involved with stimulating tumor growth because they become slightly abnormal, become immunogenic, which means our bodies look at those normal proteins that have become abnormal in cancer and say, this is not normal, and they try to generate an immune response against these proteins. So proteins that can stimulate an immune response are called antigens. That's good for us because the fact that people already have somewhat of an immune response against their cancer means that maybe we could change the character of that immune response, or boost it to a level that would make it therapeutic. Well, you have immunogenic proteins, but how do they actually get presented to the immune system? Well, there's always a middleman. And in the case of the immune system, the middleman is called um, an antigen-presenting cell. So many of you in this room have had a lot of blood taken from you to get white blood counts, right? And white blood counts are critically important. 
Well, probably a lot of you don't know that that white blood count um, encompasses all these antigen-presenting cells. So that white blood count is really critically important for your immune system. These antigen-presenting cells, things like monocytes or macrophage, kind of surveil all over the body, and they pick up proteins that are shed, or they look abnormal and they have to be destroyed, and they chop them up into little fragments, and they present them on receptors that are recognized by T cells. And down here I have a picture of a lymph node, and inside the lymph node are two types of T cells, CD8 T cells, which are called cytotoxic T cells, or killer T cells, CTL, and then T helper T cells, which are CD4 T cells, and I'll talk about them in a second. The most potent antigen-presenting cells are called dendritic cells. But if you think about that white blood cell count, they're less than 1% of all white blood cells. And the reason why dendritic cells are so rare is they're so good at revving up the immune system. If we had them running all over our body, we'd probably have lots of autoimmunity. So the dendritic cells aren't found anywhere. They're only found in places where we're exposed a lot to pathogens, like in our gut or in our skin. So what's critical for tumor immunologists is try to get those very potent antigen-presenting cells to be the ones that are involved in stimulating the immune response against cancer, because I'll show you why cancer proteins are immunogenic, but not very immunogenic. The antigen-presenting cells present the antigens to T cells, and I told you about the two flavors. The CD8s are killer T cells, but over the last decade, we've come to know the importance of these CD4 or T helper cells. These CD4 T cells don't directly kill tumor cells, but what they do do is secrete natural substances caused, called cytokines that basically act like a vitamin for the immune system. Particularly cytokines like interferon gamma or TNF alpha, these are very inflammatory cytokines. So they can make a situation in the body look dangerous. If you have a tumor that doesn't really appear too dangerous to the immune system, but somehow you get a lot of interferon gamma or, or TNF alpha expressed in that tumor, suddenly a danger signal is turned on and that tumor looks, starts to look like a bacteria to the immune system. Finally, the biggest step in generating tumor immunity is to somehow overcome the tumor microenvironment. Unfortunately, tumor cells don't just sit there, and they don't sit there immunologically either. They secrete cytokines themselves, like TGF-beta, that have been shown to really turn off the immune response. They also secrete substances so that those antigen-presenting cells that are at the site of the tumor don't function anymore. So as the tumor gets bigger, the tumor becomes immunologically more difficult to recognize. So as you develop immune-based therapies, you have to understand what all the problems are in that circle. But one of the positive things that's happened in the last decade is that hand-in-hand, Tumor immunologists, basic immunologists, people working in cancer biology, the world has kind of come together to really begin to understand what those mechanisms of immune failure are. The biggest mechanism of, the immune, of immune failure really lies with those antigens or immunogenic proteins. I told you that cancer proteins are recognized by the immune system, and there are a ton of proteins that are recognized by the immune system. They're found inside the cancer cell, intracellular proteins. They're found on the surface of the cancer cell, cell surface proteins. They're secreted by the cancer cell, secreted proteins. And here's a list of just some of the proteins that are present in cancer that can stimulate an immune response in cancer patients. The biggest issue with these proteins is that all of them are self. And we don't want to generate immune responses against us. They're not mutants, they're not viruses, they aren't foreign. These are aberrant proteins, and I'll show you some of the reasons why they're slightly immunogenic in cancer. But what happens is our own natural mechanisms of helping us prevent autoimmunity actually turn on once we start developing an immune response against our cancer. So cells like T regulatory cells, which are found everywhere in our bodies, um, begin to go to the site of the cancer where the immune response is being generated and they turn it off. Um, not because they're trying to be detrimental, because they're trying to save ourselves from ourselves. So immune tolerance is one of the major mechanisms by which cancer 
evades the immune system. But we know in some patients, immunity can be a very good thing. And this is data that was generated by a group in France. There are data like this now in multiple different diseases. But this was just a very nice story. Um, if, if you ever like to read it, the references are down there, and we can send them to you. But what this group showed in looking at over 400 colon cancer specimens was that if you looked pathologically at whether they had those T cells, those CD8s and those CD4 T cells in their tumor, they could identify patients who did very, very well, who had a very good survival. And over there, you see a survival curve. And in the red, you see that the red bar is much higher than the low bar. And what's different about those two patient populations is the presence of T cells or these lymphocytes within the tumor cells. And in fact, what they found is if patients had a high density of these lymphocytes actually broken into the tumor like you see up there and really densely infiltrating the tumor, that it's those patients who had a much better survival than those patients who didn't have a high density of those lymphocytes. So this group took 75 patients who all had the same stage of disease, stage 3, and they matched them for all the prognostic factors. And then they looked not at the proteins, but at the genes that encoded the proteins. And they basically looked at every gene that was in the tumor. And they saw which genes were turned on that would encode proteins that potentially were involved in the cancer, and which genes were completely turned off. And genes that are turned on are red, and genes that are turned off are, um, are black or blue. And what they found was, a pattern or a signature of seven genes that if these genes were all turned on, the patients did much better. There was only a 20% chance of relapse. Um, but there was a group of patients who had none of these genes turned on, all in the blue. And these patients did much worse than what would be predicted for their type of cancer. So this turn on of this interference signature, this inflammatory signature, really predicted those patients who would do well. And this interference signature is actually related to the T cell infiltrate. So some of these genes encode what the T cells are secreting, what enzymes the T cells have in them to be able to kill tumor cells. So they were able to determine that if you had a Th1, which is that interferon gamma immunity of those CD4 T cells and memory that is central and dense within the tumors, that you fall in a category where your immune system actually is beneficial in potentially eradicating your cancer. So we did a study where we looked at the peripheral blood of breast cancer patients, and we said, all right, so we know we need this inflammatory CD4 T helper immunity that secretes this, these cytokines. How much of it do breast cancer patients actually have? And here, um, if you go up to the immunologic monitoring laboratory, they can show you data like this, is an assay where we actually take the lymphocytes out of the bloodstream, flow them through a cytometer, and we look at those lymphocytes that are specifically responding to the antigens that are expressed on the tumor, those immunogenic proteins, and characterizing them for the cytokines they secrete in response to the antigens and whether they're CD4 and CD8 T cells. These patients all happen to have immunity against cytomegalovirus, which about 80% of the people in this room do. And so we were able to compare their immune responses to their tumor with their immune responses to the virus. And as you can see, the breast cancer patients had pretty good immune responses to the virus, but they had a big hole in their repertoire. And the hole was they had literally none of those CD4 T helper interferon gamma interference signature producing T cells. So the very signature that in colon cancer predicted those patients that would do better was lacking in those breast cancer patients. And you can see up here um, the interferon gamma that the levels of response are significantly lower, not only than any of the other T cell responses to tumor antigens, but also to their own CMV response. And when you further characterize the immune response to look at those effector memory cells, which we would like to be dense in the middle of the tumor, they had absolutely no effector memory response to any of the tumor antigens.
So this is a problem because a CD4 T helper response could potentially be very beneficial for a number of reasons. And a big reason is that that type of inflammatory T helper response can set off a war at the site of the tumor and allow a broadening of immunity to multiple different antigens at the tumor if you could find those cells and send them to the tumor. And the way this happens is, if you can generate an antigen-specific T cell that secretes this type of Th1 cytokine, like interferon gamma that we saw was missing, the one nice thing about T lymphocytes or stimulating a T cell response is that T cell will go to the site of the antigen it recognizes, no matter where that is. So unlike chemotherapy that you have in your body only for a short period of time, T cells stay in your body for years. And as long as there is antigen that they recognize, they will keep proliferating and generating more T cells until that antigen has been eradicated. These CD4 T cells, like I told you, don't directly kill the tumor. But what they can do is they can home to the tumor bed and secrete these cytokines. And interestingly, these TH or inflammatory cytokines can actually take those non-functional antigen presenting cells that the tumor has influenced not to respond and turn them into functional cells by creating that danger signal at the tumor site. And what happens once you have that is these antigen presenting cells begin to cause a lot of tissue destruction and debris. They pick up lots of different immunogenic antigens and they begin to present them to the immune system in a very dangerous way so that the immune system no longer thinks that it's generating autoimmunity. The immune system begins, because there's so much inflammation in the area, to see this as a very bad thing, and the attack begins. So cytotoxic T cells begin to come in and be generated, and then you really start getting tissue destruction. And what eventually happens is a broadening of the immune response to other antigens in the area, and you get immunity to other antigens. So our question was, how do we generate that type of immunity with vaccines or other modalities? And we decided to start with breast and ovarian cancer as our targets. Now, a big question we always get asked is why breast and ovarian cancer? And even though our group is um, about 80% women, that isn't the reason why. Um, breast and ovarian cancer are very immunogenic, so we know m many of the immunogenic proteins present on these tumors. We also understand the mechanisms of immune failure very well. Our groups, as well as others, have really defined what the major reasons are the immune responses aren't functional. And there is a very critical clinical need. Not only are these relatively common tumors, but very interestingly, both of them are extremely amenable to standard therapy. So even in very advanced stage tumors, you can treat patients with breast and ovarian cancer with chemotherapy and surgery, and initially patients can go into a very good response or even a complete response. But relapse after optimal therapy is the major problem. At certain stages, the chance of recurrence is extremely high, over 80%. And once the tumor has recurred, it's very difficult to treat it. And most importantly, unlike Diseases like pancreatic cancer or melanoma, we have Dr. Margolin here who's a world-renowned melanoma physician. Um, the time to relapse is extremely long. So you can be treated and five years down the road, six years down the road, eight years down the road, have your first recurrence. So it's really a prime time to stimulate an immune response in a state where we know that there's probably some micrometastatic disease or disease we can't see because we know the cancer is going to potentially come back. And it's a, a nice period of time for the immune system to really start working. So now I'm going to talk about some translational approaches that we've taken to answering those questions that I started the talk with. And by translational approaches, I really mean taking something from the bench into the bedside. So the first part I'm going to talk about is really focusing on this side of the paradigm, um, finding antigens and stimulating an effective immune response to them of the right phenotype, that Th phenotype, and having them home to tumor.
The first antigen that we focused on was the HER2 new oncogenic protein. And a lot of people in this room know what that is because their breast cancer or ovarian cancer overexpress over this protein. And this is a picture of breast cancer that overexpresses HER2. And if you could see at the very top part of the slide, just this gray you know, mass of cells, um, those are normal breast tissue. But when you see these big cells that look like they're filled with uh, DNA, they're dividing, um, those cells stain a brown color because they all have HER2 new protein highly upregulated on their surface. And that's staining, it's called immunohistochemical staining. What we found very early on is that the higher the level of expression of HER2 new you have in your breast cancer, the more likely you are to have an existing immune response against the breast cancer. So here you see some patients who have low level expression of HER2 new immunity, two plus expression of HER2 new immunity, and three plus expression of HER2 new immunity. And almost 20% of patients who have three plus expression of HER2 new immunity, have three plus expression of HER2 new on their cancer, have some detectable immune response. So for us, this meant that tolerance was somehow circumvented a bit in patients who had HER2 new overexpression. So it should be a reasonable target to um, attack with a vaccine. So we thought, well, how would we do this? We know we want to generate that CD4 T cell immunity. And I told you before that T cells kind of recognize immunogenic proteins, not directly, but after they've been chewed up and processed into fragments and presented on the surface of APCs, or antigen presenting cells. Lots of work going on in other disciplines have come up with computer modeling programs that have actually let us predict what fragments of proteins would stimulate CD4 T cells or CD8 T cells. So we did a lot of work to identify those proteins that were already digested for the immune system and create a vaccine from those peptide fragments that we could generate in the lab chemically. So the second thing, now that we know we can have a handle on getting those CD4 T cells, how do we make them those inflammatory T cells? And for that, we needed to bring dendritic cells into the picture. Well, I told you there aren't very many dendritic cells at the site of the tumor. But where there's a lot of dendritic cells is in the skin. And actually, this is a picture of mouse skin. And you can see there are so many dendritic cells in that piece of skin, you can hardly you know, walk 20 microns without hitting one. So what we thought is that we would give this vaccine into the skin, so along with a substance that would activate the dendritic cells. It's called GMCSF and that would help the T cells be able to recognize self. So these dendritic cells would get activated, they'd pick up these peptide fragments, they'd run to that draining lymph node, they'd give out that danger signal because dendritic cells aren't supposed to be there, and that Th1 phenotype of T cell would split into action. So we tried it in a mouse model, and the mouse that we use is a mouse that's called a new transgenic mouse. And as an embryo, it's engineered to have the new gene within its genome. And this gene is targeted to its breast area. And when the mouse gets older, it begins to develop breast cancer, just like women do with HER2 new positive breast cancer. So we used computer modeling programs. And this is the work of Dr. Vilay, who is here today. She was giving one of the tours to predict immunogenic epitopes, or peptide fragments, of new in the mouse and basically vaccinated the animals. That's that panel up there with a peptide P781. And as you can see, the mice develop pretty good interferon gamma producing. This is an assay that looks at interferon gamma T cells, not only to the peptide fragment, but also to this MMC, which is tumor cells derived from the animals that overexpress new. So these fragment-specific cells can actually respond to tumor when they're put into a tissue culture with the tumor. They don't respond to a tumor that doesn't have HER2 new or any other controls. And when you look at exactly what cytokines these T cells are secreting, they are secreting so much interferon gamma, it's off the charts. So what V did next was um, she took animals and she gave them a bunch of tumor as if they had really advanced stage disease. And she let the tumor grow very big to the point where 
you know, the animals really had well-established uh, breast cancers. And then basically she took these TH cells from this experiment and she began to give them T-cell infusions. And even if she used, um, here, here's animals that uh, didn't get any T-cell infusions. She gave them T-cells specific for one fragment or T-cells specific for three fragments. The more T-cells she gave specific for the tumor, the more the tumor was held at bay until um, the tumor could stay stasis, in stasis for quite some time. And so this was very good information for us that at least in an animal model, that strategy of replacing that CD4-TH response might be something that would result in an anti-tumor response. So our last question before we went into patients is, well, how should we immunize? If you can see um, in V's experiment, giving all those T cells to the animal with well-established disease didn't necessarily cure the animal. It helped a lot. Um, and so what we did was we went back to that, those animals that had well-established disease and we gave them a vaccine. And what we found was the vaccine didn't really do much. We had to really increase the number of T cells with adoptive T cell therapy. But if we gave the vaccine before we gave the tumor challenge, the animals were pretty much protected um, against the disease compared to getting um, the immune, immune adjuvant GMCSF alone. So we backed up and we said, okay, we're gonna immunize against self. So I don't think we're gonna be going into patients who don't have cancer, but what is a cancer state that's very similar to no evidence of disease? And that is those very high risk patients who've been treated to the point where we can't see their disease anymore, but we're really concerned that the disease would come back. So early in 2000, we did our very first vaccine study. And you know, I think some of you went up and saw the big mama with Meredith. I can tell you we're still analyzing that vaccine study from year 2000, and it's really taught us a lot. And, and I'll show you some of what it's taught. And um, it, it, it can't be said enough, and I, I know that there are people in the audience right now who'd back me up on this, that keeping samples on people for a long period of time as the technology changes really allows you to go back and understand more um, what was correct about the immune response or wrong with the immune response in terms of clinical trials. So we're very serious about patient specimens people give us, and they've taken us a long way. We immunized patients with a peptide fragment-based vaccine from her 2 new that we used and designed in the same way that V did these animal experiments. People developed immune responses. They developed immune responses at the same level as you'd see with a tetanus response. But um, other things happened that were very interesting. And one of the things that happened is not only did they develop high magnitude immune responses, they developed epitope spreading, that broadening of the immune response to other antigens, both within her 2 new and this is an example of all the patients from this initial study, there were about 60 of them, in the gray developing immune responses against the fragments they were immunized with, but in the white bars developing immune responses against fragments that they weren't immunized with. And this means that they did have a broadening of the immune response throughout her 2 new but what was more exciting to us is that they began to develop immune responses to other breast cancer associated antigens. So here's an example of two patients having no immunity to HER2 nu or another antigen, P53, prior to vaccination, but within six months of being vaccinated, began to develop new immunity to P53, which is a well-known breast cancer antigen. So we presumed that that would be a marker that those Th1 T cells were homing to the tumor and creating that danger signal. Well, um, Dr. Salazar in our group, who many of you know, uh, we've gone on and we've done a lot more vaccine studies and tried to refine our techniques and looking at a lot of different therapies. Uh, just about a year ago went back and said, well, we want to know what happened to all those patients in our initial study. One of the benefits of generating CD4 T cell immunity is that you create that immunologic memory and you saw that that effector memory was missing in breast cancer patients. So she contacted all the patients on the study and she came up with quite a few of them. And she asked if some of them would give her blood, and about uh, 10 or 12 patients did. And what she found was very interesting. With a, a follow-up of about eight and a half years after vaccination, 60% of patients still had pretty good levels of immunity to HER2-new. In fact, I have precursor frequencies there. About one in 22,000 of their circulating white blood cells were 
cells that could attack HER2 nu. And this is um, about what you'd see after getting a, a hepatitis B vaccine. Some patients had very strong immune responses, about one in 7,000 of their T cells. And what was even more interesting is um, the largest group that we had, 37 stage four patients. And some of these patients had stable disease that was still existing but not responding well to therapy. Out of that patient population, at 10 years, 32% were still alive. Whereas the SEER database, which um, houses a lot of cancer data, would have predicted about 10% would be alive. And stage three patients at 10 years, about 60% would be alive. Now, this study predated Herceptin, so none of these patients ever received Herceptin on the study. And it was a very interesting study for us, and so we've gone on now to a very large phase two study, which we're trying to enroll, and I know some of you here are enrolled in that study, to see if these data that we collected on this large phase one study are actually true. But what Lupe also asked is, out of all those immune responses we generated with these patients, which immune response would have predicted survival? And in a multivariate analysis, in 42 breast cancer patients correcting for all other factors, epitope spreading turned out to be the independent predictor of survival. And in fact, in stage four breast cancer patients, those with 32% survival, um, you can see a uh, a little, a little more than 60% of them, or a little more than 50% of them survived if they had epitope spreading. So this has really changed our whole outlook about vaccination, really away from the antigen and more toward how do we develop more potent va vaccines to stimulate this epitope spreading? Because it's the generation of this type of immune response that probably is causing that destructive inflammation. And so you can imagine, if you think about the progression of breast cancer, all the genes that are associated with that progression, um, one thing that we find very exciting is those genes that are displayed in yellow, our group has shown to be immunogenic. So you can kind of come up with an idea of a multi-antigen vaccine, not just for her 2 new, but for any breast cancer, targeting the very proteins that are causing the cancer. We were very encouraged by those results of survival, but there was still patients who didn't survive. And so this naturally drew us to, can we use the immune system to potentially treat patients whose disease is no longer responding to therapy? And this led us into um, a, an area that we never thought we'd go before, and that's the area of adoptive T cell therapy. And these are the group of patients, or the group of uh, scientists in the tumor vaccine group that work on T cell therapy. Yushi Dang in our group, Dr. Dang, made a very interesting discovery as she tried to monitor the responses that we saw in vaccination. And that discovery was, if patients received a vaccine, we could take their T cells from them and we could grow them up in great numbers to make them specific for their tumor. And we spent a lot of years in the tumor vaccine group trying to figure out what's wrong with the immune response against cancer by growing up tumor-specific T cells, and they're very difficult to grow. And part of the reason why they're difficult to grow is there are not much of them. And T cells like to grow together in groups. So once we hit precursor frequencies of about one in 22,000 of those white blood cells specific for her 2 new, we could literally grow up the T cells in culture like they were virus-specific T cells. And here you can see in vaccinated patients, we could expand their tumor-specific T cells 20-fold and get precursor frequencies of these interferon gamma-secreting cells that were literally off the charts. And so what Yushi did is she devised a way that we could very readily, in a lab, expand these tumor-specific T cells. So she took leftover blood from our specimen core, that big mama, and she um, tried to expand T cells from leftover blood on a lot of the patients we had in our clinical trials. And she found, with a very simple expansion method that lasted only about 18 days, she could generate this activated memory phenotype almost all of interferon gamma producing cells. And what she found was the better the patient was vaccinated during the time of vaccination, the more T cells she could generate from the patients. So we went back to some of our patients who enrolled in that initial study and unfortunately had relapsed and now um, were no longer responding to therapy. 
And we said to them, want to come back to Seattle because we'd like to try to increase the immune response you had by logs. And that's what adoptive T cell therapy is, really growing up an immune system outside the body using specific cytokines and then infusing it and literally replacing someone's immune system with an immune system that recognized their cancer. And I'm showing you some data from one of our first patients who is a, a lady with ovarian cancer. And she came and she got her T cells and we give a dose of cytoxin prior to the T cells to rev up the immune system for the T cells. And what we found was we gave her three infusion of T cells that the T cells lasted at very high levels for very high, a long time. And in fact, at 450 days, if you think back to the slide I showed you where after vaccination at 10 years, about one in 22,000 T cells were specific for her too. She had one in 100 T cells, one in 300 T cells specific for her too. And um, during the time that we followed her, which was just the first 40 days of the protocol, she had a 50% regression in liver <coughs> lesions. And so this protocol is now um, open and we're enrolling patients. If you know of anyone who's got HER2 new positive disease, we're now uh, doing priming vaccinations and collecting T cells using vaccinations only to stimulate T cells to take out, to grow up to great numbers. And in melanoma, it's been a very promising treatment, and we hope that'll be the same in breast and ovarian cancer. So finally, I'm going to end by talking about a whole new translational approach, this time focusing away from the T cell and focusing more on the tumor and the tumor microenvironment. And here's the group of scientists who really work on why does the immune response not work in cancer, and how can we modulate that tumor microenvironment? I talked to you about dendritic cells, and I told you there are not uh, enough dendritic cells in the body to stimulate immune responses to cancer. But when you look at the few dendritic cells that are present at the site of the tumor, or even circulating around in the body, they don't really work very well in breast cancer patients. So here you can see their ability to take up antigen in stage even two or four disease compared to volunteer donors is very depressed. Um, their ability to proliferate or cause T cells to proliferate is depressed. Their ability to cause T cells to stimulate that critical interferon gamma cytokine is depressed. So we started thinking about how can we turn those dendritic cells on a little bit better. Now, over the last decade, we've figured out a lot of ways to turn dendritic cells on. And one of the things that we know from basic immunologists and people working in infectious disease is that dendritic cells have receptors on their surface that are specifically for bacteria. And if you think about all the dendritic cells in your skin, one of the biggest places um, we potentially can get killed is by a pathogen coming at us through the skin. So the dendritic cells have a special receptor called toll-like -like receptor that is specifically for bacteria. And when a toll-like receptor is ligated on a dendritic cell, it sends an alarm. Please help me. A bacteria is in the area. It is going to take over my body and die. And the dendritic cell gets activated in a way that it really um, significantly generates immune responses of that inflammatory phenotype. So Dr. Haling Liu in our group, who can't be here tonight because two days ago she had a baby boy, um, did an experiment in the animal model using a very common toll-like receptor ligand agonist that some people might have used in this room. It's called a miquimod, and it's used as a, a treatment for some genital infections. It comes in a cream, and Dr. Gad had noticed that the mice, when they develop breast cancer, if we don't treat it right away, they develop um, breast cancer of their chest wall, very similar to what's seen in women once they develop a chest wall recurrence. And so Hei Ling thought, uh, along with Ekram, what if we create this kind of danger signal? We know there are some dendritic cells in that breast cancer. Can we turn them on with a miquimod? And what they showed was if they um, had pretty big chest wall lesions and started treating them with a miquimod, a topical cream, they could not only um, stop the lesions from growing further, but actually cause tumor reduction compared to animals who weren't treated. And when you looked in the tumors using this PCNA stain, you can see that control animals who were treated with like cold cream, basically their tumor was growing out of control. 
But if you looked at the amiquimod tumors, the tumor had completely stopped growth. And looking at a genetic analysis, kind of like that colon cancer study I showed you, there were profound changes in gene expression. They were either turned off or they were turned on. And when Hei Ling looked at the genes that were turned off and on, she found that almost every gene associated with an immune pathway was turned completely on. And in fact, the interferon gamma gene was turned on and stayed persistently turned on for six to eight weeks. And she also noted, looking at the immune response that was developing in these animals, that they developed high levels of CD8 T cells, those killer T cells that really respond to viruses. So this was very good evidence that these killer T cells specific for the tumor were there because they were starting to recognize the tumor as the virus because the dendritic cells treated the tumor as a virus. So Lupe Salazar, along with a collaborator of ours, Jim Wiseman, has started a clinical protocol taking women who have these refractory chest wall metastases and seeing if we could do the same thing that we saw in the mouse. And what um, Lupe and Jim have demonstrated, and this is a picture of a chest wall metastases in an area of a previous radiation in this woman, that they could treat the woman and cause um, almost 90% reduction in this chest wall metastases. And what was very interesting is this lady also had a cervical lymph node metastases that regressed during the time of treatment. A group in Germany has done um, a couple of patients this way and demonstrated here's lots of cancer in the skin um, that after a miquimod treatment of the skin, the cancer literally can't be detected. So we have a phase one clinical trial ongoing, a phase one, two, if anyone knows of women who have these chest wall recurrences or skin metastases, Dr. Salazar would be very interested in talking to them about potentially enrolling on this study. The final thing is getting back to this immune response, these regulatory T cells, which dampen immunity naturally. They're meant to stop the immune system from generating autoimmunity. In breast cancer, it's very well documented now that if you have lots of these FOXP3 expressing cells, you have a, a, a worse prognosis than women who have very few FOXP3 expressing cells. This is a marker for T regulatory cells. Similarly, um, Tyler Curiel demonstrated that ovarian cancer patients who have high levels of T regulatory cells also have a worse survival than those who have low levels of T regulatory cells. So Dr. Keith Knudsen, who's now at Mayo Clinic, when he was with our group, he went back to the new transgenic mouse where we know they have high levels of regulatory T cells in their tumors. And basically here you can see on this panel, their tumors are pretty full of T regulatory cells. And with Dr. Salazar's help, they found a reagent that was used in the treatment of lymphoma. It's called ONTAC. And it hits a receptor that's on the surface of lymphoma, and it causes cells that have those receptors to become inactivated. It turns out this is a, the same receptor that's expressed on these T regulatory cells. And so what Keith showed is if he took animals who had tumors and he treated them with ONTAC, he could make those tumors stop growing and in advanced stage animals really regress. And furthermore, when he took out the tumors of those animals as he was treating them with ONTAC, not only did they get a decrease in the T regulatory cells in the tumor, but they had an increase in activated T cells. And they were T cells of that phenotype, that inflammatory phenotype. So what Dr. Salazar did is she said, OK, so we know that this ONTAC works in mice. Let's go to ovarian cancer, because we had a lot of data at that time that T regulatory cell infiltrate in the peritoneum was a very big problem. So she started a phase one trial, it's almost done now, where she took women who were no longer responding to therapy, and she infused ONTAC through a catheter directly into the abdomen where the ovarian cancer was. And what she found was very similar to what Dr. Knudsen saw in the mice, that the higher the dose of ONTAC you had, the greater the drop in T regulatory cells you had, both in the peripheral blood, that's at the top, as well as in the tumor itself. So we were able to take um, material out of the patients through washing their abdomen and looking at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and seeing a drop in T regulatory cells. And as we went into higher doses, we began to see decreases in CA125 
um, that was really associated with patients feeling better. So this study is ongoing. It will finish once we find the dose and go into a phase two study. And that's an example of how you can use that translational approach to treat people whose disease isn't responding to more standard therapies anymore with the immune system. I'd like to end with just a few slides of, of Dr. Liu and, and um, Dr. Mei Wu, who are working on cancer diagnostics along with Yi Yang, and showing you you can also use the immune system to potentially identify those patients exposed to cancer. The new transgenic mouse, which we use as a model of breast cancer, is interesting because although the animals will develop breast cancer that looks histologically very similar to, tumor, to humans, only 70% of animals will get breast cancer, and 30% won't, even though they all have the gene that predisposes them to breast cancer. So what Hei Ling and Mei Yang Yi asked is, when you develop breast cancer and you start developing an immune response, can we identify a marker of that immune response and potentially use it to identify those animals that are going to get cancer? And they used a technique where they took the entire DNA of the tumor and they put it into a library that they could probe with the serologic response so that they could do immunologic screening of the entire tumor. And here's an example of a plate where they had an antigen that was very immunogenic and they were using antibodies from the patients, to, uh, from the mice to identify the antigens. And what they found in these animals were that the animals began to develop an immune response here at week 28 way before they developed tumor that we could see. So this was a good suggestion that perhaps the identification of antibodies against tumor-associated proteins could, pre, uh, uh, could identify people who'd been exposed to cancer. When we went back to the breast cancer patients, again, going to Big Mama and taking out a lot of serum, we found that they had immunity to multiple um, oncogenic proteins or multiple proteins in their tumors, IGF-BP2, P53, NYESO, MUC1. Um, the cancer patients are in kind of the pink, the volunteer donors are in white. So there certainly was enough immunity to tumors to see whether we could create a cancer diagnostic. And so this is very preliminary data um, that uh, Hei Ling and her group have generated that just using an antibody response to three of these proteins can predict a breast cancer patient from a volunteer donor with 85% accuracy. So this is a burgeoning program in the group and we hope that within the next couple of years we'll have a test that we can take to a clinical trial to see if women with slightly abnormal mammograms, we can use this test as an adjunct to say, you need to go for biopsy now, rather than wait around for six months to get retested for a mammogram. So um, in essence, we're really working hard on trying to harness tumor immunity, not only to prevent and treat cancer, but also to potentially diagnose cancer. And I think it's really groups like ours that have scientists working at the bench as well as in the clinic that this type of translational approach can happen. So the last few slides, I'm going to introduce Dr. T.G., our scientific director, and she's just gonna give you a little bit of a um, overview of how research operations run and what it takes to put something like the tumor vaccine group together. Dr. T.G. So, how do you actually translate the discoveries of the laboratory and all of these things that Dr. Deesis talked about into clinical trials? How do you get from that little mouse that's a transgenic mouse into breast cancer patients and really do that? I was um, thinking about how do you explain the process, like what's behind the scenes making all this work? And it really came down to just a number of key factors. The first is that our group is unique, and as Nora talked about, it's translational research, bench to bedside. We have a very um, closely working rapid cycle group. So we have a laboratory, that laboratory is very closely related with our clinical trials group. And our clinical trials group is the doctors and the nurses 
and the people who recruit patients. It's also a full-time person who's basically dedicated to making sure that everything is done right in the regulatory way, that human subjects work is done, that everything is, um, everything is covered from a regulatory standpoint, and that um, we have all of the I's dotted and T's crossed. So we have to have that rapid cycle model. We also have to have um, sponsorship. And we have a number of research sponsors. This, list, this slide lists just a few of the current research sponsors that we have, without whom we couldn't do the research. They pay for our research. Um, we get a lot of money from the federal government to do this work. We get money from private donations. And we use it all to do the individual projects and then to integrate that into therapeutics. Another factor that's really important is strategic vision. And we're in an academic environment, so the academic environment in the university is our incubator. And we have taken that approach and really then put it into a business model of diversification. So for example, five years ago in 2003, we were using about 75% of our research dollars came from the National Institutes of Health. And at that point, five years ago, we could look at where the federal government was and where NIH funding was and said, hmm, if this were a private portfolio, maybe we would want to diversify that a little bit to reduce our risk, to make sure that we can keep doing all of the work, the laboratory work, the clinical work, all of which is funded um, from different sources. So we've transitioned that research portfolio to about half of our funding coming now from the National Institutes of Health and the other half coming from other sources, again from gifts from foundations like the Komen Foundation and other breast cancer foundations. Um, and some from industry. We do this in a context of always maintaining our core values. We are, as I said, in an academic environment and we have industry partnerships and that has a place within the context of our core values. And um, our industry influence is relatively small, but it's really important to be able to have um, some public-private partnerships as well. Another key factor is our scientific collaborations. And this uh, slide is put in just to demonstrate some of the key collaborations that we have. It by no means lists every scientific collaboration that we have, but it's really important part of our culture that we work with other scientists in, in the community, in the region, and across the nation. We work very closely with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, with the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and with a number of universities across the country. And finally, we have to have benchmarks. So we have many individual projects, many different people that are focused very hard and working very hard in individual things. How do we know if we're really moving forward the big question of how to detect cancers early, how to cure cancers? And so these are some of our benchmarks that we put in place. So over the time period of 1996 to 2008, the tumor vaccine group current lifespan, we have um, had approvals for five IND applications. That's an application to the Food and Drug Administration to take an agent from the laboratory in a mouse model and to actually test it in humans. And the FDA has to approve that before we can move forward for a phase one clinical trial. We have opened 17 different clinical trials and enrolled 280 patients during that time period. And we've published 118 peer-reviewed scientific papers. And in addition, we have presented many posters and given talks at scientific conferences to share the research. These are our benchmarks. And finally, the last part of our research operations is really training the next generation of scientific researchers. So on this map, you see the yellow stars. These stars are, represent trainees from the tumor vaccine group who have moved on to their own laboratories or um, starting their careers um, in, in a scientific enterprise somewhere across the country. And many stay in the Seattle area and are in hospitals or over at the Fred Hutch or at the SCCA. Um, many move on, start their own laboratories at Mayo Clinic, at the University of Michigan, um, and so forth. In addition, we have um, people who have been visiting scientists from other countries that are now in Korea, in Italy, and in Sweden. <clears throat> 
And um, our dedication to training the next generation of scientists ensures us that we'll have collaborators down the line to work with and to help us in our discovery. Thank you.